I'm Michelle McCollum. I think thank you guys for coming in and some of you traveling from far away and battling the traffic and getting out here. But I mean, my gosh, wild things. It's, so it's, it's a bird. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we've, we've discussed this all together. Um, my vision for pulling this group together was um, not to really have something that was structured, but just some open conversation. I think you guys are some of the best minds in the state about what we should do um, with smart growth with South Carolina being you know, one of the top, if not the top, um, states in the country with inward migration. How can we help our mostly rural communities, but of course our larger communities as well, think about a more comprehensive look at how we continue to grow in the state? So um, I'm going to turn it over to the, to the President of the Senate and to Tom and to Pam, and uh, we'll just get the conversation going. I think first we should maybe go around the room and let everybody introduce each other. And then as we come back around, we'll turn it over to Lieutenant Governor. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Maria Xavides, and I work for Mall to Mall Firm with Tom Mulkey. And I'm Mary Davis. I'm the Director of Greenbelt Programs for Charleston County. First Greenbelt Land Conservation Program in the state, as well as the local government goes. Helping Berkeley and Dorchester State in Arizona as well. Eric Budd is Deputy Executive Director of the Municipal Association of South Carolina and provide education, training, technical assistance, and legislative advocacy and support for the 270 months of the town since then. I'm Will Haney. I'm mayor of one of those 271 towns. I'm mayor of the town of Mount Pleasant right across the market. Tyler Sir, uh, up in Surfside Beach, Merle Zilla, Serva, Horry County Council. Charlie Whitney, the Baltimore Paul Gays, I'm the director of the Center for Marine and Weapons Studies in Coastal Carolina. I'm going to go to the academic community. I'm here for comedy for Tom. I'm Jeffrey Gilbo, the planning director of the Appalachian I'm Chip Bentley, I'm the Deputy Executive Director, former Planning Director of the Appalachian College. I'm Ken Roper, I'm the Biggs County Administrator. I'm Tom Mulligan, I work for Michelle McCollum. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder what you did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thomas Alexander, State Senator, District Number One, uh, Oconee and Greater Pickens, uh, Greater Clemson area, Pickens County, President of South Carolina City. I'm Pamela Abbott. I'm the 93rd Lieutenant Governor of the great state of South Carolina. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, super proud that I have been part of this in some very, very small way uh, since its uh, inaugural kickoff, uh, the SC7. Um, you know, really bringing a light onto uh, the challenges that we have here in South Carolina. I was just um, in North Charleston talking about uh, with the Realtors Association. We were talking about a lot of things that we talk about on a a much you know in-depth scale but you know things that they are kind of worried about is uh, affordable housing and like you said this great this huge influx of people that are coming into South Carolina uh, they are projecting that by 2024 the population of South Carolina will double Wow! and so that would take us from 5 million to 10 million people and you know what we're talking about trying to tackle that becomes a big part of it you know, where, where are we going to put everybody? Where are we going to house them? How are we going to protect our green spaces? How are we going to make sure that our infrastructure is in place for it? And so I think a great thing in this is we have a, a diverse group uh, to talk about what are you facing. I think a lot of the problems, uh, it just became more apparent to me in this last round table I was at just 35 minutes ago, um, was infrastructure and the difference between, uh, you know, it'd be good to hear um, from Pickens County and from Horry County, uh, you know, I'm hearing that most of the problems are coming at the local level when it comes to, you know, infrastructure and what's being done and when it comes to housing permitting and things like that. So I think these are great issues to kind of talk about and then how you feel that on a local, uh, on a local front, how are you prepared for that kind of influx? And what would you need to prepare for that kind of influx? So, I don't know. Which one of you at a local level, or Tom, if you want to jump in, or President Alexander, thinking about what do we do with that kind of people, you know, that kind of influx? Can you get ready to jump in? I don't want to, I don't want to jump in front of this August five. <laughs> First, but I would say that I think Lieutenant Governor points are, are well made. 
challenge we have in Pickens County is that we know the growth is coming and we know that it has huge positives, but we don't want to make it change the basic nature of who we are. Um, the story that I've told before is when you're a public meeting, you're talking about growth, talking about attainable housing, talking about land use regulations. And a guy came up to me uh, in my almost eight years as a prosecutor, 15 years as a criminal defense attorney, government lawyer during that time, county administrator now for five years. I've never been physically assaulted, except for this one time. And he kept, with his closed fist, punching me in the chest. And he said, when are you gonna fight for me? And I said, well, we're here. Right? That's what we're here. And he said, when I moved here from Atlanta six years ago, I never thought I'd have to deal with this. What we've got is what the whole world wants. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's what I heard you say. So we've got to figure out a way to to have that South Carolina open door, but also not change the basic nature of our, our heritage, our ecological heritage. And I don't want to do a speech on the No, that's no, no I, I think. <laughs> I think that's absolutely right. I think you heard the governor said it yesterday in the movie, is how do we um, how do we protect what we have by, you know, um, conservation conservation easements on land, you know, he'd like to see that double so that our children, our children's children will still be able to hike and kayak and, and do all the things that people love to do today and love to do for generations. Um, so it is a balance of growth, and where do you put growth, um, along with protecting all the things that Tom and Michelle and are bringing to life that we, that we really need to protect. Um, I did hear a lot about um, today from the realtor side, is like on affordable housing and things like that. Um, you know, when, when people try to do that, the pushback they get from the localities. Um, We've seen some of that. When we put in for really the first time in Pickens County any type of any type of land use regulation with the CT thing. Uh, that was the, the pushback. It's, okay, where is the workforce? How is it for make it personally? Where do my children live? Where's their starter? And and so it is a real issue. The realtors have done a good job about pushing back on our natural inclination. You know, people talk about building the wall. Uh, build a wall on, over the Saluda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've had to we've had to fight that. There's finding that solution, and I think that part of that solution is what do your subdivisions? What is your housing? What does it look like? What are you making that subdivision set aside uh, before you allow it to be? Because we've got to hit those price nice points. Yeah. And that's where it has to be workforce development. It's and housing as well as we sometimes we talk about affordable housing and the context out there with most people affordable housing is different than workforce housing what you're talking about are professionals out there today with it across the board teachers law enforcement uh, folks that are not able to have that dream of that first home for so I think it's a great challenge and, and to have the opportunity and, you know we have minimum and, and to your point that we have minimum housing standards in South Carolina, but there's nothing that says that folks cannot have above those minimum standards. And that might be a way, too, that at least needs to be on the table for consideration from that standpoint. Is, is the minimum enough to quality of the housing? So, Tyler, are you on the on county council, the fastest growing county in South Carolina right now, Horry County. Like, what are some of the big things you're seeing with infrastructure and growth? And that growth, I know you and I have talked about this in the past, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on how the people, kind of like you're saying, they're saying, hey, we don't want anybody to come in, but the people that are already here are now paying for some of those uh, amenities that are needed in the more rural areas because that's where the growth is pushing. Like, how? What do you see we have to do, especially being down at the coast too? How are we protecting while growing, while doing that efficiently? Yeah, it's interesting. It's um, listening about the transportation and plus one of the biggest. Everybody wants to come to South Carolina, right? And you 
look at Warrior County and what we have to offer the beach, everybody wants to be close to the beach. And they're coming in droves. And Warrior County is not just one of the fastest counties in the state, it's one of the fastest in the country, right? And it's not changing. You know, I think Senator Alexander made a good point. You look at some of the headlines right now in the state and some of these national home builders and the people are, you know, really upset with their quality of construction. And so one thing in Warrior County we did was pass some minimal design standards that go on top of what the IDCC had in the state level. Um, increasing overhangs, the type of materials and construction materials that were used on the outside, um, requiring some kind of landscape requirements. So, you know, one of the challenges that we face is uh, in dealing with our stormwater department is, you know, when you have these mass major subdivisions come in, it's the clear cutting that has to be done to be able to put in the stormwater infrastructure to be able to deal with all the pervious and impervious areas that's taken place to build these homes. And so being able to put buffers in place to keep the rural identity of some of these communities. Because Horry County is really diverse. So you have the beach <coughs> tourism area that's east of the Waccamaw River, but then you go west and the Loris and the Longs and Nichols, and it's really rural. And how do you preserve that? Um, so one of the things that we're doing right now is putting in a, a rural preservation district to allow developers to come in and have smaller lots, which helps them drive their costs down so you help with the price points for more affordable housing. <coughs> but at the same time, you have large buffers. So you have a 200 foot buffer on the front that's fully rural and scenic, that's untouched. Um, and then 100 feet on the side. So if you're driving down a, a rural road, you just don't see it. a whole new subdivision just popped up. Um, that looks more urban than what it is. And so, uh, and then on the transportation side is utilizing uh, the transportation paths what we're doing in Warren County. Uh, we've been doing it as a capital project sales tax for the last almost three decades. Uh, but one thing we're doing this year is going for a transportation tax, which will be for 25 years. And it's going to generate close to $7 billion in Warren County. Uh, and so I haven't, without thinking the time, we're able to do creative financing and all these road projects with a limited amount of contractors out there. You know, it's taken us seven or eight years to get a lot of these major road projects off the ground and shovel ready with the permitting and then letting other projects. And so by being able to stretch this thing out and have a more comprehensive plan, we're able to build new roads uh, and take traffic off of our existing roads. And that's to the point where we are in Warren County. It's widening the roads, it's not enough. We gotta have new roads built. Um, and that's not something that's just exclusive to Warren County. That's something that I think a lot of these counties across the state are dealing with. You can't just keep widening these roads because you're bumping into businesses, you're bumping into people's front yards. So you gotta build new roads. Um, and I know the struggle right now in the states, you know, we gotta fix our existing roads, but in Warren County to fix our existing roads, we gotta build new roads, so. Great point. No, I think mean, this is an interesting point because you're talking about preserving the feel of the road when you're out of passage. I don't know that I have to figure it That was a conversation that would have been alive for five years ago. It would have been. Sometime in the middle of the night, there was no press release. Sometime in the middle of the night, in 2021, everyone's opinion changed. So this <laughs> issue, uh, it went from private property rights, you can't tell me what to do with my land, to overnight, please tell all my neighbors what to do with their land, because it's impacting my life. Uh, but that, that feeling, uh, start, when you start actually talking to people now, and, and Tom, this is a conversation that you started your first trip through, President Alexander, the state says no. Thank goodness, because the county through this conversation, we're going to have double the minimum standards on repairing staffs. So we, we double the amount of space you got to be the body of water. And it's because this, this kind of conversation, so what do we want this community to feel like? It's partially, uh, I think, a story that we tell each other. And once we start telling them, sort of, uh, then suddenly the solutions are out there. But you've also, in your presentation the other day, in terms of what y'all are looking at as far as the different distances from the urban areas, right? Because it has to be larger tracts of land, at least that's well, something that, in consideration. 
that's exactly what he was referencing. We're going to read. We got uh, for the first time. We got, and I love the names of these that came straight from our conference. And it's amazing how State Mall like, gave us the tools we needed. But uh, we have our Appalachian. What, what did you say? Get that microphone right here. <laughs> the, uh, we have our uh, first. We have our Cherokee Foothills Scenic View Shed that has design standards, which was developed a lot of the ways by these ACOX folks. Uh, he, he was actually president of the meeting when everybody's been in the He said, uh, but then we have our Appalachian Heritage area, which has a, uh, you can't have smaller than two acre lots. You have to have 30% of the space. Those sorts of things. Then you go to our agricultural heritage area, which is six mile days, mill center, you know those areas, uh, where you can get a, a slightly smaller lot of the open space has to sit. Until you get all the way down to your constituents area, close to where they're beating that house in real hard, and you can have. The eighth and acre lot. So it's, it's recognizing that type of heritage. It's a different conversation for us. That's one of the Well, you're knee deep in this. Literally. <laughs> well, we're, we're the poster child for the small coastal town that was it got overrun. And when I was elected mayor the first time, <laughs> back when I was a freshman elected official. When I was elected, we were the fastest growing municipality east of the Mississippi River. And so one of the first things we did, I kind of ran on it, and the citizens backed it and everything, was we reinstituted the building permit allocation system that we were the first town in, in South Carolina to ever have one. And it, and, and it was approved, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it, and it was approved 20-something years ago. And that happened when Mount Pleasant's growth rate in the early 2000s was 14 or 16 percent. You know, imagine what that does to, to your budget. Um, so in the last five years, we've issued as many single-family building permits as we used to issue every year. So that's the first thing we did. We pledged, you have to have a study. You can't do it capriciously and arbitrarily just say, I want to build that wall, right? You can't work that way. We looked at our calls for first responders. We looked at our stormwater runoff. We looked at our calls for um, fire and everything. By the way, interesting little little asterisk in here. Our fire department answers 240 fire calls a year and almost 10,000 medical calls per year. And you know, oh, we got a camera in here, but it can't be this room. Someday, some brave official is going to say fire departments are much more medical than they are structure fire and find a way because it's all one big department right now and you can see i mean 10,000 to 200 and something but i'm not messing with that <laughs> so we we implemented uh, some growth uh, to management tools and, and they have worked and for those of y'all that are on the beginning of that you will hear from everybody. You'll hear from Chambers of Commerce. You'll hear from the Realtors Association. You'll hear from the Home Builders Association that you're going to bankrupt the town. You're going to be sued. You're going to lose millions of dollars. And nobody's going to want to move to your town. And none of that happened. None of that was true. And the lesson we like to point to is if you're familiar with the old village of Mount Pleasant, it's right down by the water. It's a designated historic district, and it has Thank you, Lord. It's own commission that have handles like if somebody wants to add an addition or change a roof, there's architectural standards and all that. It has the most restrictive building and the most restrictive design standards, and it is the most desirable and most expensive place in Mount Pleasant. So protecting the, the nature and quality of a neighborhood or a whole town adds to value. Everybody is, is, is better off, but I can't, it, it has just calmed down since, since really the, the pandemic. But those first years, 18, 19, and then to 20, everybody was telling us how, you know, we're going to ruin the town and everything, and all these things work the exact, the exact opposite of that. I think maybe, um, Eric, might want to Program, which is why I'm invited in it. Sure, yeah. And so, obviously, land 
conservation is one, one part of the puzzle. You've got to break off planning and affordable housing and all that stuff, too. Sometimes those conflict. But um, the one point I wanted to make is that there's just so much funding at the state level and federal level right now for land conservation. If you don't have those local matching dollars, you're really missing out. Because Berkeley County is standing up their Green Belt program. Um, they haven't even started it yet, but they have an opportunity to triple their money right away. Uh, it's called the North Island Project, the Woods Authority. And uh, there's just so much opportunity out there. You know, if you're not taking your local dollar and making it two or three dollars, you're really missing out right now. Um, I think we're starting to feel that pressure, certainly across the low country, because Dorchester County started theirs, Berkeley County starting theirs. There's the county green space sales tax. So options. You don't have to bundle the transportation. There's everything from what Spartanburg County is doing. You know, they just set money aside in their capital plan each year for land conservation. So start somewhere, whether it's just allocating funds in your budget for that so that when the opportunity arises and you can leverage funds, you're ready to go. Uh, so that would be my big pitch. It's, you've got to have those local dollars coming in as people start to feel those growth pressures. I think it's an easy win. Uh, Berkeley County they won their referendum. I forget what the percentage was, but it was the highest passage of any referendum in the state ever. And it was for roads and land conservation. Combined. Combined. 10% for green space, 90% for roads. And, and I think that's, you know, people, you have to deal with the infrastructure, but to also make people feel like you're being proactive and protecting these special places. I like the couple of transportation with green space. And I share you heard you do. We we've only dipped our toe in this pool because if you're talking about general fund money, still in our community, if you're talking about general fund money, you need to be able to show some of the other second step of more this idea of conservation. So we uh, this is how we got money for our, our conservation fund. This is the first year of it. We use the tax, the lingua tax a sheet money process. So if someone uh, don't, if they don't pay their, their taxes, Senator Alexander, if you don't pay your taxes, and we auction <laughs> your house. That would never happen. And we auction your house off. When we walk auction your house off, all we get is the taxes that are due. The rest of that money sits there for five years waiting on you to claim it. If you don't claim it, then it goes to the general fund. Well, I, we did convince the county council, and I, they voted for it, to make that go into a conservation fund. Something bad happened, so they lost their house, let's do something good for it. But that is just different. I mean, it's not, it's just different. So I'm encouraged to talk about that. Yeah, I gotta, gotta start somewhere. You know, there's state conservation banks, fundings at, at an all time level, state office of resiliency, national funding, and they almost all, if they don't require matching funds, it's heavily, heavily weighted. You gotta have that money ready. To that point, too, I was going to remind you, we did the farm. Land uh, Conservation Trust Act this year yes, sir. as well too. So that's another thing, kind of making sure that we're protecting those um, areas outside uh, of the, what we normally think about conservation. And, and so I hope that the municipalities and the counties will, will use that from a, again from a partnership standpoint of uh, protecting some of this land. So, so we're we're doing the same thing. We, we bought thirty-seven thousand acres. Across the Lewis Ocean Bay Preserve off the International Boulevard, to create our own mitigation bank. So we're in the process of going to the core to form our own mitigation bank. So we have to go out on a third market and buy mitigation credits for our seven billion dollar transportation tax. That's favored at like seventy five percent of the polls are passed. And we passed the other free ride programs over the last three. If we didn't have these ride programs, Story County, I don't know where we would be with roads uh, from a local level. So this been funding. Back when Tom Rice was a congressman uh, for the seventh district, he brought, he brought down the Secretary of Transportation at the time, about 10 years ago, and we built 31, which runs parallel to the beach, up and down the Grand Strand, and we built the local dollars. And it's basically like a, a full-fledged interstate, but built at the local level, this four lane. And so, um, you know, one of the biggest things at the state level was being able to have three paying sales taxes that got uh, the Attorney General's opinion, I think Dorchester is actually using it 
to do your transportation tax that you're speaking about. And a lot of these big counties are starting to go after that third penny to be able to, because right now most counties have an education tax, right? That's in place for higher ed. We have like a hospitality tax. And then the third one's going to be the transportation tax to do a generative jobs or for raising infrastructure. But I think all the major counties right now are going after them. I don't know if you see on the municipal level or not, but. Um, yeah, those, those taxes are at the county level. York, York, I think York's pursuing it, Berkeley's doing it, Beaufort, Orrery, uh, Georgetown County's in the process of doing it. So you look at like DOT's budget, I mean, there's not a dollar there, right, to be able to do all this, but if you have the county stepping up, um, that's where I think the big opportunity long term on transportation is how, how the collaboration between DOT and these local counties and how that's going to match for the, the greater good of the state because on the local level, the counties transportation taxes are going to far outweigh the energy budget on an annual basis. I mean, just Horry County, like I said, so over 25 years, that's $140 million a year Horry County is bringing in just for roads and road construction. Uh, and how we partner up to make it go further. And then our light in the mitigation bank, right, and purchasing these large tracts of land so they don't get developed. Just to plug, um, you know, counties that are considering some type of local option sales tax. There's a group out there called Trust for Public Land, specializes in coming in, uh, working with, with local councils, and helping with the polling, shape that question, um, really find out what the what the people want. Oftentimes, there's no cost to the, the local government. They can, they can oftentimes spend grant money to pay for the work. We work with them. Uh, they were involved in Dorchester, and, uh, Berkeley, and Charleston. I think, too, you can use, and to that point, you know, Coney has, a, has had some funding for a uh, local conservation bank, and I think around 600000 what they were able to do with that as far as matching and as other aspects really gave a great return on that investment. So that might be something for these counties that are looking for that to be able to import for some of the success that's already occurred to kind of help build that case as well from, from that standpoint. So that as, as a At a macro level, uh, we're saving about 20.5 million acres and we have about three and a half million under conservation. And when we started the Floodwater Commission, one of the recommendations was how we were going to take that three and a half million up and the governor remained firm that it had to be 10 million acres. And in an effort to get us there, we took the, the flood maps from DNR and, and now from SCORE, and we, we, I went in and presented them a plan for eight and a half million. And all he did was this. I said 10 million, top cat. And people laughed about that when we got started on this. Now, as, as this, this period that we're in, we're almost under assault locally. A lot of our local officials are frankly being taken advantage of. We people are beginning to understand the wisdom of 10 million acres. What I hear is that we need, and y'all may already have this, a tool chest to train for local officials as to how we tap in. As now I've been voluntold to be on the conservation bank board, and what I can tell you is that we're not going to be able to buy another seven million acres of state money. It's not there. So we have to use every tool that's available to us. I think if we train local officials, as we've walked now for the fifth year from one end of the state to the other, I think they'd be very eager to get this information. They just don't have it available to them right now. And, and I don't, it may be just a matter of getting people more comfortable with it. So I don't I hate to get out in front of y'all. I'm sure you're doing some great training, but we need to, one of the takeouts of this may be, here's a menu of how you do this. We will not be able to do it by just using state dollars. I mean, Say this in front of the president. Say, you know what you do. We need cities and counties to take a leadership on this. That's the only way we're going to get it. If we don't, it's not just ecological, it's cultural. Man, it's they're paving the state. And we don't want that. I don't think we want that for our, for our families. And so I think we have to come up with a macro plan. One thing I'd like us to see is like, how do we get there? Conservation Bank Board, I'm not familiar with what you just mentioned. That may be a tool in the tool chest. 
we need something tangible. We need to get it down on the ground, blue collar. This is what local officials can do, and then have the conversation. I tell you, if you want people to be convinced, I was telling the senator over lunch that just get them to do a low flight over Greenville, Spartanburg, Anderson, Academy. Pickens, Pickens. You can't believe what's going on. I mean, they are paving the state. I, you know, I've, I've struggled with this because I get asked a lot. To, what do we do? What I can tell you is the governor is a whole lot righter than wrong about 10 million acres. If we don't do that, we're going to lose our state. We're, we're getting ready to be New Jersey. The transportation roads is a big part of it. Flooding, the pervious service, we're going to end up paying for it one way or the other. Flooding is a lot worse where there, a lot of what I see going on is clear cutting, slab houses that are going to be houses where the standards 20 years from now it's going to be another issue who's going to own these places so I, I think that collectively we need to have a conversation we need to come up with a tool chest local officials what I what I bump into is that is along the trail and a lot of what I do over the years people at a local level are being approached by very sophisticated savvy developers coming in from outside the state being given a song and dance buying into things and not understanding the impact what you talked about will what is the impact fee Fort mill did an exceptional job they went we're five thousand in camden i think they're twenty five thousand between impact fees and school board fees which immediately pump the brakes because that begins at a five but then you get the workforce housing and that comp that creates a more complicated conversation because we can't stop the and here's the other thing it's coming <laughs> it's not esoteric like this isn't something we're talking about like it's not coming it's here and if we don't create some tools where local officials can really be a, a part of the solution we're going to have some really difficult flooding issues that are, that are going to be made worse and worse forgive me i love what you're saying will you made a good point ken I think that something could come out of this conversation. It's not another documentary, but short videos on, on tools for local officials that are being taken advantage of. I've seen it in camp. That would be hugely helpful because when Mayor Haney was talking about, if you're going to hear, you're going to hear from the different groups that they're going to sue you, they're going to do this. I was thinking, he's hacked my email. We spent the last year in, we, we've been in the moratorium. We just came out of the moratorium. We went into and came out of the moratorium and, and kept working hard, but through through a lot of pressure, through a lot of pressure, a lot of people tell us, no, you can't do that. Right, you can't do that. Right. Well, I think that's where your council of governments can really be that balance in the room and can be those educators yeah. because they're held in our area, and I would hope across the state, very high regard by the local municipalities and the counties that they can be that that they can can do that education yeah. and and, um, and to me it's as much about you know what doesn't work as, as well as what does work I, I think it's uh, from that standpoint so, and I'm sure the municipal association but again that's the cogs are just they're, they're just they're just viewed in a different independent level I guess yeah they were a little different than Eric and his group, and that we we interact with them. So on this these general topics, been in the last year and a half, two years, going back to Pickens County, the larger scale discussion about Highway 11, to being in Liberty and Inman recently, talking about comp plans, and each of them in different places, and just the education of those groups, whether it's the council, you know, councils or the citizenry at both levels, about things that are going on, and all the things brought up are the same things, whether it's on large scale like Quarry or and everything down to in the, and sewer and working with Spartanburg and others, be able to have that conversation and bring resources to them so they know what's available um, is really, I think, it's an interesting time and in that I think more people are open to that discussion than they ever have been up in the for 20 years. So, Jeff started with me left and came back. But, um, so we've been there a long time and had these conversations, but I've literally had that conversation up on Highway 11 at least three times and two or three times. So when we went to do the project in Highway Level of the Quarter, Jeff and Lance, another planner with us at the time, 
we went to that first public meeting, I said, okay, so here's how it's going to go. Been here, done this, seen it over and over again. We're going to get there. There's going to be some people that like this. There's going to be a lot of people that don't like this and everything else. So there's about 60 people in the room, and we started a conversation going down that openness. And all of a sudden, everybody's mentioning zoning, and they want controls, and they want, and I'm like, hmm. So we, we go through the whole meeting, and it was completely 180 from what I expected. We get the car on the way back, and both of them look at me and you lie. I'm like, yes, I did. And we wholeheartedly lied completely. I'm like, 25 years, like, I've literally been run out of the room politely, but run, ask, ask for a little leave um, for those conversations that changed. And I do see that all through the upstate right now, and that those conversations are just different on a base level. We want to see things happen because we want to protect what we have. But because they've never really looked at it that way, they don't know how to do that, where the conversation begins. And so, you know, I think we're all, this session has great training every year for new council members. And that provides a lot of information to them. It was a good, good chance to do that to them. But then within the communities themselves to help them kind of carry that and work through those. Whether it's you know, county social municipal association, the council of governments, I think we can all participate in some level to kind of help drive that conversation and bring those. Because yeah, I'm still learning say, things here. Yeah, I will <laughs> say that uh, two things. One, I was in the room when that happened. You, know, you will see an exercise in just like mental agility. <laughs> he really did. It was impressive uh, to see him do that. Uh, but the, on a serious note, the Senator Alexander, the, the way that the cogs are seen as neutral is a huge asset. It is. I to agree. be a, a mechanism for you. Because there was a feeling, at least in Pickens County, that what are y'all trying to force on us? And when the cog came and was able to say, like, oh, this is a tool that's commonly used, so that's, that carried some weight in yeah. our conversation. Yeah. Do benefit from being with people from outside the room, outside the community to come in. We can say the same thing that council's been saying for a long time, and they're like, oh, they're, <laughs> they didn't listen to council or somebody else. Okay, but, yeah. not all the time. I think one of the association's greatest concerns is that our small rural towns and the uh, unzoned portions of rural counties are in a fall location. The big problem that we see is that those small towns currently can't afford a proactive approach to plan. Um, two, three employees, very small budget. Um, I think that's the role that I see for the Council of Governments. Um, you know, several of the colleagues have very strong planning programs, but not all of them do. And it's mainly a matter of funding. So at some point in time, you have to figure out a way to fund them so that they can proactively assist these small towns in developing comprehensive planning programs before that development hits. Because they're going to get the most dense and poorly constructed units because of the regulations that they have in place and lack of staff resources. Well, maybe we could use and I don't want to dominate this, but maybe we can use that model that we used with the uh, rural infrastructure authority when we did the ARPA money and we allowed some of that money to be used to help those uh, entities that were needing water and sewer done but did not have to your point the resources or the people on the staff from that standpoint. So we allowed them to go in there and utilize their resources. So I, I think that's a point that maybe we can take back, maybe we provide some additional funding to the COGS. Uh, maybe we give you too much, maybe we use what you already got. But look at that. Look at that. See how he's shifting? <laughs> <laughs> so but, but being able to, to, to do that, I think would be a, a great sort of, I, I think you'd find good support. From, from the General Assembly to help provide those resources to make sure, because the way I look at those rural areas and those counties, I mean, it's kind of like an open can canvas, and we got one time to get it right for yes. yeah. them, and if it's not done correctly, um, then, then we've lost it for, for the future. Talking about being down to I mean, please don't change um, uh, your, your beaches down there. Garden City is our favorite place to go, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's because of the feel and what what is there from that standpoint. So don't don't let them be changing beaches like that. And we want to create other opportunities in these rural areas. I mean, I do think that's a great opportunity for us to 
direct growth into those and, and bring manufacturing and things into those rural areas and not be in town. And Tyler, Tyler brought up a, a good point is that they went in above, up and above state standards. Yeah. And then I, I kind of toss this over to the senator. Is that something we should be looking at as a state level for raising those? So in the meantime, those small rural communities, we almost create a safety net where they can't be taken. Like, is, is that an easier, quicker route than to try? You know, funding money is tough. I know, I know you all don't think that. But funding money is very tough in Columbia. But like, if, if we could say, like, you know, this is our base. That this was good back when we wrote it. But now, we, like you, you said it eloquently. You know, we have a, a blank canvas, and if we don't, if we don't throw some really quick protections on this, it could get so far ahead of us before we can really put our arms around the problem. How do we? Is you think that there's an appetite for that? I don't know. If it, I think it'd be worth having the conversations. I, I, I think. I could see municipalities and counties having some pushback of, of us raising those standards, but I think if we give them some incentives exactly. to raise those standards, right. I think that would be a good way uh, for us maybe to look at it to kind of sweeten the pot from that standard. And if I may, one of, one of the um, takeaways from when Charleston had the Dutch dialogues about resiliency and flooding and everything <clears throat> was not from the conservation community, but this takeaway was from the finance community, and that was you need a standing resiliency committee on your municipality. We had everything from recreation to police to fire and water supply, but we didn't have a resiliency committee. Tom here has spoken to ours at least twice, and we're trying to get him back, and I will say this, when Tom comes down and speaks, the room is full and, and staff members not in those departments come down to hear it because everybody's fascinated by it. Never know what he's gonna say. <laughs> no, everybody's fascinated by it. And so when we just did a, a $50 million bond issue last year, and we were told standard poors and moody's, before they give you your AAA rating, they will ask, show us your resiliency plan. So they went through all the other rigmarole and everything. And they said, final question, show us your resiliency plan. And my finance director, our finance director said, I went like this, let me show you this. <laughs> and she pulled out and closed up this. Boom, there it is, because we have a new green commission that helps us with green space. They're not regulatory, they're just advisory. And you have to be credentialed, you're not just an activist, but we have the former head of the Corps of Engineers here, we have people who are certified uh, water, you know, uh, engineers and people that do all that stuff, wildlife biologists, everything you can think of. Um, somebody from the Nature Conservancy and all that. Showed them, showed them all of that and they said, you just saved this town a whole lot of money. So if we could have something from the state that incentivizes, you know, I, I know everybody has to have a comp plan, but, but we see it, you know, locally. I just finished the, the Riley um, Forum for Mayors, Design Forum for Mayors, and in my cohort, was the mayor of Holly Hill, and they are in ground zero for, for growth. I just read in the paper that um, even though they're in Orangeburg County for now, they're, they're de-annexing and going into Berkeley County. Mm -hmm. Berkeley County's at 47% growth. I mean, that is un unsustainable and unmanageable. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> if he had a, because his council's not with him, but the mayor sees it, we can't, we can't go like this, we can't keep going. Schools can't handle it, the stormwater can't handle it, the, the sewer uh, and water can't do it. If the state gave an incentive for council members of little towns like Holly Hill to get on board, you know, because if, if you look at what we're dealing with in Mount Pleasant today, the port, their, their computer system is down so the trucks aren't getting in. That whole part where the Wandell Welch Terminal is, which is the biggest part of the container ports of, of the Port of Charleston, is in Mount Pleasant. That whole area was supposed to be an industrial warehouse complex. But in their wisdom, our forerunners in Mount Pleasant over the last 30 years let, you know, oh yeah, let's rezone this track from light industrial to residential. Yeah, that makes sense. So now we have these huge residential neighborhoods and million dollar houses right outside the gate wow. where 275,000 trucks a year are coming up. And they complain to the mayor, those trucks sure make a lot of noise. <laughs> yes, like living near an airport, those plane, you know, you bought near an airport. But you know, who does that? And it occurred to me that 
you know, one idea at a time doesn't seem stupid, but when you add them all up, you go, who did that? Because everybody's got the next best idea. Just let us build these homes there. And they did it. And now, how, you know, on a day like this, how we wish they had it. I've made, I, I made a note about the Senate. So I think that's something else yeah. that come out of When was that property rezoned? Huh? When was that property When? The last one was in, I'm trying to think, was either in 13 or 14. When my, I think when my, I think two predecessors as mayor before me, um, it's right next to the interstate. You see it on your right if you take 526, and there's a neighborhood there called Grassy Creek, and that was the last light industrial zone uh, place in Mount Pleasant, and they turned it into residential houses. Not a, no, no vision of that at all. Amended the comp plan to do it. I know. That's the worst thing for me. A lot of these rezoning that took place back 15, 20 years ago from the last recession, they just sat there yes. undeveloped. Yes. And now they're getting developed. And everybody's like screaming bloody murder about it. They should. Because stuff's getting built in the wrong That's places. Right. And it's not just in Mount Pleasant, it's everywhere. But, you know, 20 years ago, and we're dealing with repercussions now. They have um, dusted rights. They do. Um, but Senator Alexander brought a good point about the ROI the mitigation banks. The mitigation bank that we're doing, there's just like significant ROI there. For the 37,000 acres, I think we're going to like either double or triple our money by us having our own mitigation credits for these new roads that we're going to build, by having that internally and not having to go buy them on the third market. So, you know, before I believe the capital project sales tax was the only tax that you could have like as a third penny because we've been doing this transportation tax for or four decades now, but the AG came out with his opinion that said you can have a transportation tax as well as with the other two taxes. So we're going to generate more money. So you talk about <coughs> you get the 10 million acres, you do it by tapping in and doing these mitigation banks because no other county across the state is really doing that internally. I don't think on a road. I guess they're doing a conservation bank or doing mitigation banks. We are typically not involved in mitigation banks. Right. But when you're doing these transportation taxes, as York and Charleston and Dorchester and Berkeley are passing these transportation taxes, which they're going to pass because people want the roads. And to a certain extent, they're not new taxes. They're just supplanting the old tax, right? the existing tax. You're going to have a substantial amount of money to form these mitigation banks that will go to conservation, yeah. but also be a big ROI because you got to have the mitigation banks anyways. And you're directing, <laughs> you know, you're protecting land in your county. Right. And not necessarily buying credits that are protecting land in an adjacent county. And so like with transportation tax, we're not building a road for the first seven years. Because you got to do all the permit. So the money's just accrued in the bank. We're earning interest off of it. And then we're going out and we're setting up this mitigation bank like we did three or four years ago that we're going to be using the credits in 20 years. When you do a transportation uh, referendum like that, does it have to be listed? Do the projects have to be listed on a referendum the way they would be just like a regular capital projects? It's a really good point. So in Horry County, our transportation tax failed like in the 80s because it wasn't listed. And some counties don't like it to go that route. Where we've had a lot of success is we went to the voters and said, hey, these are the projects we're doing. Right. So you know what's going to happen. And all the municipalities get on board. Because everybody's seeing the benefit in their communities. And the voters, there's their transparency there, right? So they're seeing which road is going to get built and then you don't have, you know, elected officials and bureaucrats getting in the room and you change the projects, you know, in 15, 20 years from now. Uh, we know what our needs are right now to get them off the ground. So we've built over the last three ride programs a uh, sustained history of like doing what we're saying we're going to do. And now we're going to the transportation tax and no, you don't have to list them, but we are. That's the point. And we're listing them out and everybody knows that they are. And so they're listed out. We, we did one thing is we had two buckets on there for 600 million. So like, what's that? 10% of the overall collection to go for um, unassigned in intersection improvements. So we can team up with our local CTC right. that gets money and say, hey, let's both throw in $5 million and fix this intersection. Because that's what it takes for kind of fix the intersection like 10 million bucks. That's just the going rate. <laughs> But I think the mitigation, yeah, the ROI that you brought up, there is significant ROI there. And that's how, you know, you tap into the local money to See get your 10 million acres. Yeah. And there's a benefit there financially. One of the things I wanted to mention before I 
ruined my reputation and got into politics. I, uh, I was the executive director of the Low Country Land Trust, you know, who has the, uh, the easement on things like Boone Hall and the Angel Oak and things like that. We didn't have those then. But this was in the go-go days before the Great Recession when <clears throat> we were doing what we call landscape level conservation easements. I mean, we couldn't do the 10, 15 acres here and there because there were easements to be had. The biggest one that I got to sign the Form 8283 for was Brosnan Forest between Somerville and St. George, 13,000 acres of the North Southern, Southern Honey Preserve. But um, so having done that, and we did uh, in the eight years I was there, we did over 50,000 acres. What's, what's rural and protected, and sometimes protected just means not having sewer and water. That's one way, you know. If we can get a handle on, and Senator, this is one of my, one of my go-tos today, if we can get a handle on um, the permitting of septic tanks, you're gonna hear a lot about that um, tomorrow. <clears throat> because on the one hand, been hearing a lot about that. <laughs> we're spending tens of millions through Mount Pleasant Water Works to get septic tanks out of the ground and DDAC is approving 200 septic tanks for new development in Allendale on the outskirts of our only Class A wilderness area of Cape Romaine. It does not make any, any sense at all. <clears throat> but now that I'm in this sprawling suburb of Mount Pleasant with roughly 100,000 people in there, everything I see in this aha moment for me is I've, I worked on the rural side you know, for a good portion of my career, and now I'm working with the town of Mount Pleasant. And the towns, the developed areas, the built environment is where it gets messed up. Because every bit of stormwater that, that we run off, every bit you know, where we don't slow it, store it, and then discharge it, which is a, a big mantra, we are, we are messing up our marine ecosystem, ecosystem. And our shrimpers out of Shim Creek will tell you, when they go out of Charleston Harbor, they have to go almost to Bulls Bay or almost to Beaufort to catch shrimp now because there's so much runoff that it has changed. I don't know, doctor, you may know if it's salinity, temperature, a mixture of all of that stuff, but they're telling you all of that, that you know, the guy dragging the nets will tell you, I can't catch shrimp off the Isle of Palms like I used to. I've got to go up to Cape or Bulls Island. That's more time, more fuel, more ice they've got to buy. So I, I'm just kind of on a mission to get help for me, because I, I don't claim to have all the answers in this, but we sure see all the problems. And one of the things we're fighting now, or fighting for now, is to, um, and, and it's not a one size fits all. We're surrounded by marsh on three sides and a national forest on the other. But we are trying to strengthen our tree ordinance and our tree mitigation bank and all that. And people are pushing back because they don't like pine trees. Well, one, Every pine tree is not the same, Doctor, as you know, on the Atlantic Coastal Plain, that longleaf pine is one of the most resilient trees. And after Hugo, people that flew in and knew could see where the stands of longleaf were standing and all the lob lollies look like they've been cut with a weed here. So just to say pine trees are dangerous and will fall in the house is not necessarily accurate. And, um, and also there's builders and developers who don't want the extra cost of, of mitigating but every tree, right, Tom? It's in the movie. It's in the documentary. Every, every large tree, every mature tree that we take out is about 10,000 gallons of water that we've got to deal with otherwise. And so the big mess is happening in the built environment, and that's where we're trying to make improvements. We just passed a thing last year. Tom was there to discuss it, our low-impact development standards for commercial and we are easing those in to, to residential. We don't, we're not there yet. There's incentives for a residential, but it's everything from the amount of pervious surface. You know, for commercial, we want charging stations for electric vehicles. Um, it's stormwater runoff, it's tree canopy, it's shade. It, it's all of those things. It's, it's, um, I, I was surprised how easily we got to yes on that. That was one of my biggest surprises. But we're trying to clean up the mess on our end because we probably got more pavement, I guess, if you take Charleston and North Charleston, but, but we probably got more than all the smaller municipalities combined, you know, just right there in Mount Pleasant. One of, one of the reasons that I really wanted to call you guys together today to talk is we're going into our second hour, and, and I don't think we're going to keep this dragging on if the conversation doesn't mm -hmm. lend itself to two hours, but um, something that you just brought up, Lieutenant Governor, just a second ago. Um, there's an urgency 
uh, with this matter. And I think we're all seeing it, that you know, it took 30 years that we've been working on the, the change in mindset of zoning versus no zoning, you're not gonna tell me what I can do in my backyard. But literally five miles from my house, there is now a four-way stop that used to be this beautiful rural drive and over the past year and a half, they've cut down, there's not a tree in sight, not a single tree, and they're popping up those slab houses everywhere. You can reach out and touch the house next to you. There's two little schools, an elementary school and a primary school. They cannot handle the influx. If you go through that area now, and you go through at a certain time of day, you'll be waiting at that four-way stop for at least 45 minutes. It is not sustainable to keep doing that, and we can't wait another 30 years before we figure out how we're gonna train local officials, educate local officials, change mindsets for the local people. So, do what what do we do? Like, do we come up with that growth plan that you just mentioned? Or maybe we don't call it a plan, we call it a strategy, but there's gotta be some kind of tools that we can give the local communities to be able to access those tools very quickly and we move at a faster pace. Because otherwise, the landscape, cultural, ecological, economic-wise, it's gonna be it's going to change here in South Carolina within the next five years. So, do you all have ideas of how we can make that happen? I've got specific ideas, Michelle, but this is what you talk about. You were talking about tipping points. You were talking about how I could work it changed in the middle of that meeting. No, it didn't. It changed years before. It's just you got, I, I've got something to tell our staff that there aren't tipping points, they're rubber band on. It's like when it snaps back, it's, it's going the other way fast, right? And so I think if we look at this, I don't want to say city, but this is a moment. It's an opportunity. We're watching this happen, but it's, it's, an, it's not too late. I mean, you you sense that, it's not too late. So we need to act now what we can. And I think this conversation, you know, the, the rubber bands, we need to ride it to the other side and take advantage of this moment because there's a huge groundswell of folks that are listening to what you're saying here. Let me say, so one thing Ken's doing in Davis County is been trying to work with the municipalities who we got good good he's got a good right. municipalities. Um, but I, 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 I applaud the effort because I don't see that in the counties. I have other counties kind of openly hostile kind of cities and so forth. But the, the conversation, so the cities, especially the rural areas, are the infrastructure base. The development is happening outside the cities. Sometimes on that infrastructure, sometimes not. The rural corner, and then you can't, the schools can't handle it, the roads can't handle it, the water, the sewer, the Right, exactly, there, there's no pattern. And, and to their credit, they're trying to begin a conversation with these properties about, hey, how can we partner and look at our development areas and where they should go, and we can look at maybe focusing development around the city center. Right. There is infrastructure instead of out here on the farmlands in the middle of nowhere where you don't have that, but you're going to, but you're going to draw it all. Um, and along those lines, I think the challenge is, is how to begin that conversation between the counties and the cities and get them all in the room together to look at the benefits. Because I know for some of with other counties, they think the cities are just in our way. They're they're doing things that are going to harm us, you know, prevent us from growing as a county. And that's not true. You know, really necessarily, everybody benefits everybody, and that conversation needs to be holistic. And right now, it's not. It's oftentimes fragmented. The counties doing their thing, and look at. And admittedly, from a political standpoint, the county's voting base is way different than the city's voting base, and their interests are, you know, going to be completely. It's hard to get that conversation on the same level. Yeah. You can sprawl ship, you can sprawl away from the tree, but that's where we are. Exactly. You can actually sprawl where it's uniformly in favor of county. It's uniformly <laughs> tailors. Like my whole county becomes tapers. I, I love going to the tapers. Do you live in But I don't want the whole county. I don't want the whole county to be career. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, yeah. and, and that is, and, and Greenville County is a good example of how that happened in a lot of ways around it because the county council's mindset for growth and development was completely different than the city of Greenville or Greer or some of the towns who saw it as we need to focus and plan our growth and how that, because they have a limited space in Greenville County. Which road exists because everybody ignored every zoning decision they ever made. Said no, let's just rezone that. Let's even though the cop plan said for 20 years, no, you shouldn't, don't do this. And you know now you're going to spend 120 million dollars on a Woodruff Road bypass that probably doesn't actually improve traffic on Woodruff Road. Um, <laughs> you know because you ignored that for 20 plus years. And that so how did I don't know how to get that conversation started and bring the two into a room together to do that. But 
I don't know that it'll work, but the, what he's yeah. referencing there is we proposed an idea that the municipalities do a voluntary moratorium on annexations mm -hmm. until we can study the idea of having a countywide planning commission. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity in the state hall. That, that might be an actual avenue we you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, about how that would work. And it makes different sense for the Liberties, Centrals, Pickens than it does for the Easleys and Clemsons who might not be right. as, as amenable to that. But there's a there's an opportunity there for us to stop thinking about planning and, and the power to plan as stopping the miss boundaries and and not not going to be uh, so that was the big conversation we're having. What it's resulted in now is at least people getting in the same room once a month, uh, which is important. Is there an opportunity there outside of South Carolina setting our uh, apart looking at some other areas that didn't do that planning and those pictures being worth a thousand words to say, okay, this is what it looks like when you don't seize that opportunity and you don't do it. Is this what you want or would you rather it be like somewhere else that did it right and from that standpoint they kind of have stark contrast Boswell, Georgia. Yeah. So i'm sure there's some areas there that that you could, could utilize from that standpoint yeah the houston texas is one of the events probably the really not one of the originally it is right. suffering by the front of the uh, i don't want to distract the conversation i didn't want to jump on the, the phrase urgency because that's what i was on and have been observed the process for a long time. Um, we've talked about things for 30, at least 40 years I've been here, and, and it is urgent. The train is, is already here, and it's accelerated. Worse than that is the game's changing, the pressures are changing. If you look at the reports, the, you know, the rate of water coming up in the last 20 years is four times faster than the previous. This is happening, things are happening. What I think is in, encouraging, though, is, is that multiple stories where the expectation of the fight didn't occur as it was in the past. I know 30 years sitting on the very top panel, things I could not even uttered in the past are now, you know, and we talked about it over here at the top break. Uh, I'm not going to say it in the line today. <laughs> You're not there yet. No, it's not there yet. But can you put a 47,000 pound explain something? And so I think that, that those walls are moving. What I hope we can inject into the conversation is to um, look at the, that process and realize that it is changing. that we've been making progress now, we need to live a little bit further. Because it's going to take us 10 years to do a darn thing. And we don't want to be 10 years behind when we get there 10 years in the future. So I think at some point you're talking about, can we try uh, experimental kinds of things on some scale that is um, a little bit, I mean, I don't know how you get anything permitted quite frankly. Uh, we've got to change in the academia about training people about what the environment is, what changes and whatnot. Get all the groups involved to allow um, some kind of change in how we're doing it. But these are people issues, and it's getting them out of their silos and getting them out of that we all want. And, and that solution thing is really showing well in South Carolina. That. One thing that uh, concerns me is I think we see some political solutions to the residents being upset about the growth. Political solutions sound good. But in the long run, it's going to be exactly what we're going to do. Uh, there's discussions in Lexington County right now that are going to bring rural zoning all the way up to the edges of the cities and then discourage urbanization. If you think about that, you know, if it's one unit per two acres or more, the people are still coming. So all you're going to do is spread that growth out over three even 10 times as much land area because of the uh, low density zoning that's being applied. That's a quick solution to tell folks that are upset that uh, you've got a solution. But in the long run, that's going to be the worst solution you can possibly be because you're going to cover the entire county with development. Those individuals are going to be driving. 
I know, we get it, we hear you. But if y'all don't start working together, then we all just sprawl into mass. Um, and, and so I think the way you put it, and I'm going to give you a specific example, it's amazing. You tell people, okay, I, uh, if you're, you're a big, big environmentalist, and you want EV charging stations. My airport director got a grant to get two EV charging stations at our little Pickens County Airport. It's not that little, but he called me up and he says, that will give us some trouble with anybody if I get two EV charging stations. You know? So the, there's that side of the spectrum. The other side is don't cut a tree. Or you can re completely recalibrate the conversation to we are stewards of the Lord's garden. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me, when you start saying that, I'm, I'm, literally, you got it. I'm, I'm literally quoting you. <laughs> when you start saying it that way, then everybody says, like, yeah, we are. Yeah, we really are. Let's do this. And, and so I think part of the challenge for people that are willing to have these conversations is just playing the question. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me pick up on that again. Thank you. I, um, so why, why is this urgent now? I mean, great, it's urgent. Why is it urgent? And there's two or three factors that are concurrently impacting it. One, we really hadn't defined is this amplified change in our climate where we're seeing extreme weather. Depending on where you are is how immediate that is. But we're, we're seeing really large increases in sea level rise, which along the coast is going to be a huge deal. I mean, the, work that Dr. Gaze done and just released science. This isn't hypotheses. This is how much has risen six inches in the last 10 years. That's a lot. If we go 10 more years and do six more inches, we won't be having this meeting here in 10 years. Now it is not on stilts. I mean, this is a serious issue. It's also causing extreme wedding weather with flooding and other things. So you have that going on. Concurrent with that is this tremendous economic renaissance in South Carolina where you have all these new jobs and all these people moving in, and these two things are sort of running into each other. Uh, and audience-centered communication is very important, and it's purposeful how we articulate this. We live in the Bible Belt. I'm not going to go there because I don't want to hear me. In, you know. <laughs> That's tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, tomorrow morning. Loud of you up. But I think we strategically, we People in this state will join the fight if we invite them to it. Yeah. And we talk to them in terms that they understand. And then we have to, very calculated way, determine what the continuum is. Because people, you can't push people but so far. And we don't even want to push them. We want to encourage them. We want to bring them to the conversation. We, when I heard you talk about mitigation fees, the governor's already calling saying we want uh, carbon credit back. Like we can turn this into a, an economic uh, growth opportunity for our local communities where we're selling carbon credits. We're actually looking at that now. But that's Z and we're at A. I mean, I'm, when you talk about landscaping requirements, if we could create a continuum where we say, if you can't do anything else, make them plant three trees on, on this lot, however big it is. Because one tree does, one mature tree does, in fact, absorb 10,000 gallons of water. We got a flooding issue, and then we got an immense growth issue. I learned this as commander of the state car. People are like in some of our poor accounts, why won't they do that? Because the same emergency management director is the, is the janitor at the local school and is the preacher on Sunday. Like they don't have the intellectual resources, which is the point they made. So we've got to break it down and give people the tools and work them on this continuum and then bring them to the conversation. This isn't a top-down deal, it's a bottom-up deal, and it's a lot of work. And I think that we, what comes out of this, in my opinion, is what are the tools that we need, and then what are the conversations that we have to have, and then we set upon this continuum that brings people along. And I think that in every community there's going to be different levels of sophistication, but the president mentioned agricultural land trip. Big deal. Why is that a big deal? Because now farmers are going to make money off of carbon. I mean, it's not just saving. It's not just saving land. It's making money. So, how do we take people as far as they're willing to go? And that's a strategic issue, not a tactical issue. And tactically, how are we going to meet that strategy? And it's going to be different 
in virtually every county, the level of sophistication. And that level of sophistication and urgency is going to be directly related to that environmental issue. It's going to be easier in Horry County to get people's attention because their property is eroding. It's going to be easier along the, some of the river systems because of what's going on. And it's, it's a, right now what I've seen, and this is no knock on state government, they're busy. They're not, they don't have bad intentions, they're just busy. And I think the president made, you know, the COGS, the associations, how do we assemble the resources? What I can tell you, planting 3.4 million trees on one day, 127,000 volunteers, if you ask them and they can do it within reason, they will help you. And this state's shown an amazing ability to come together. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But we are in a war now on these two concurrent challenges, and it's right now. It's not 10 years from now. If that, along the coast, if that, I mean, it gives me goosebumps. Six inches in 10 years? I'm serious. I don't, I don't want to sound like Chicken Little, but that's a lot. We're, we're videotaping this, right? So when she's governor, <laughs> 10 years from now, it's happening now. Right? Fastest growing state in the country on a percentage basis. Now. What do you say the fastest growing east? We were the fastest growing municipality east of the fastest growing county, right? I mean, this is so we've got to create a level of urgency and how we address it. But the urgency can't be in pushing people because they don't respond well in this state to that. Yeah, we we got this country. They don't respond well. <laughs> we got to create urgency here in this room yes. about a plan that invites people into the Lord's garden. And I promise you, take them out of the Lord's garden, He'll do the rest. We got to we got to draw what we know people in this state will respond to. We, this is the Bible Belt. The evangelicals have a lot to say in this state. And as we talk about it, I'm, I won't talk about it tomorrow morning, so I won't worry you with it. But if you want some homework before tomorrow morning, just read the book of Nahum. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. We, it's so easy in these conversations to go from strategic to tactical and this tactical, this tactical, this strategy. We have to agree. What makes it immediate? What makes it immediate is dramatic growth, which is a good thing, economic renaissance, and dramatic impacts with the climate that's creating problems. And those two things are creating in this state the perfect storm. Tom, yes, sir. Let me go from the beautiful strategic you just laid out down to the tactical. Two years ago, we had a municipal association uh, conference in Char it was in downtown Charleston. And um, it rotates between Hilton Head, Charleston, and Greenville. This year's Greenville, I guess, Greenville. And there is a dramatic drop-off, especially from the smaller municipalities. I'll, I'll say dramatic. I'm sure you have a head cap up. Anecdotally, from what I noticed, from the coastal ones to Greenville. Because if, if you're a, a, a city councilman in Latta, or Lamar or somewhere, you want to go to the coast. And I don't blame you. So two years ago, when we had it in Charleston, we decided this was time for Mount Pleasant to show off. Because we got this big ship called the Yorktown. And so we, we invited everybody. We said, Mount Pleasant's putting on reception for all the attendees. They told us to plan for 125 based on experience of excursions. Like they had to get from Charleston over to Mount Pleasant. All right. So about a month before the event, we put the word out with great help from the association and all that. We were at 200 and something. By the time we counted his, the night of the event, 350 people showed up. And people stood there, you know, it's the best view in the low country because you, Charleston is beautiful, but the view of Charleston is better than the view from Charleston because you get to see all the steeples and everything. And I stood there with mayors and council members all over the state saying, y'all, y'all live here and y'all see this every day. You know, it's beautiful. And it just, it was an aha moment for me. And we could use the Yorktown or something, but if we could have a resiliency conference like this, and somehow get maybe just one, you know, kind of like the, the Riley Mayor's Forum does. Our, our cohort was, was six people. And get them to come down and understand this stuff is real in one way or another. You know, I'm not sure how much, um, you know, a city councilman in Belton is worried about resiliency and all that. When I go to these things, they're mostly worried about revitalizing their downtown. But um, there's a um, saying in the, like, were y'all at uh, Myrtle Beach, the Council of Government statewide retreat a couple years ago, that Main Street is cool again. 
and people love small towns now, and it's coming and all that, but if, if we could find a way, and I don't know how we would fund it and all that stuff, but get people from these small towns and all to come and realize there are resources, there are ramifications for not being up to speed on all this stuff. And the other thing, and I'll shut up, is the state has the power of two things to sort of put things in check, and I know there's federal and state laws. One is, is permitting of septic tanks for where there's not water and sewer. And then the other is the state roads, because in Mount Pleasant, everything in the south of where the Isle of Palms Connector goes in, all of that is state roads. Everything almost north of that, except for 17 and 41, is state roads. If the state, and I'm, I'm just blue sky in this, I haven't talked through everything, it says, yeah, we'll fix your intersection, we'll, we'll put a light there, you know, we'll warrant this, warrant that, or whatever. If there were some but there, and I'm not saying take over local government, because I know how we feel when there's an attempt to provide so in the budget, which has been every year, to tell us what we can and can't do with short-term rentals. We're like, hey, you want to get in the zone? Were you in my last meeting? Because I, I was with the realtors, and I heard yeah, about that yeah, for a long time. You want to provide, provide police, fire, zoning, uh, public services, drainage, and all that to the state? Have at it, but don't tell us what we can zone where. You know, that's, that's, that's what we do. But if the state could maybe think about you know, because we don't want to come back to state and have to fix this road or upgrade this intersection every two or three years because that's not fair to the capital resources that the state has, which we all contribute to. You know, it's kind of like a beachfront management act. You can't do whatever you want to do with the beach. You know, there's a fight here in the Isle of Park about people putting walls up. And it's just occurred to me, especially in the smaller towns, maybe, maybe they're not doing the growth management things that we're doing. But if they have that incentive, we'll fix your intersection, we'll, we'll permit this or whatever to upgrade your roads, but we need to see a plan because we don't want to come back in two years and have to fix again what we just fixed. That would be an incentive to getting it right the first time. I thought maybe you were going to say that y'all would take over the road. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did that a couple of times. We said, give us the road, and y'all said, here it is. Do you think it would be helpful to do something similar and this may be a stupid idea, um, but like field trips. So like bring a group of people and let's learn about the transportation tax and see how that's working. Let's see how the Appalachian Heritage area is working for your community. Let's see how, is, is, is that something that you think people would be interested in being a part of, maybe once a quarter? We just had a big uh, Tri-County delegation go up to Greenville and Spartanburg to see about attainable housing, and it was, it was fully subscribed. So the hunger is, is there. The thing if we can do, and this is what the Senator and Tom are talking about, if we can get out ahead, it, we're the places that we've seen the downside of this, and our citizens are saying, do something, stop this. It's the places that aren't quite there yet, and they might realize it's, it's coming. But no, I like that idea about having to see the plan, mm -hmm. to make sure that there is a benefit that the state gets from doing that intersection. Exactly, and you're not just playing whack a mole. Tyler and I pick up a lot of trash together. Uh, and somewhere together with Lieutenant Governor down here, we'd have cleanup days, which is a whole other conversation. But I mentioned that I, I sometimes get rolled out just as red meat. At my age, there's no fresh meat, so I tell them just get them some. And we talk to those developers. I think it's who you're talking to in that, in that economic food chain. Because I went in with people, with large landowners, and I said, here's your option. You're either going to have more property worth less or less property worth more. And that's it. Like, those are your options. And, and it was amazing how that brought people who had large economic interests along the coast to the conversation. Because we, and this is happening, so it's not static, which makes it more difficult. It's not like a lot of issues in government where you don't deal with it this year, next year, it'll be essentially the same issue. That is not the case with what we have. We're, we, particularly on the coast, we are seeing four millimeters a year sea level rise. Dr. Gaze is here, fact check me. Every year, like we're not, this isn't modeling anymore. Like you can do this with a ruler. And that's causing nuisance flooding. It's overburdening our uh, infrastructure. It's going gonna, it's gonna to impact large resort properties. It's going to impact residential properties. What are we going to do about it? And that's the story when you talk about taking y'all up to the upstate. Greenville's done an exceptional job, but there are a lot of places that haven't. Like, it, this is what's coming, guys. 
I think there's a lot of value in that. And maybe even videos and how do we bring the whole state to this? Imagine if we had everybody with an oracle. That's what we want, I think. We want some banner big enough that we got all that we all can participate in. And it's it's a it's a big job. Nobody is doing it. We and we are doing a lot of things in this state. You know, this whole idea of climate, I, Michelle's going to start pulling me at the hotel and saying, shut up, Tom, this is your deal. Um, <laughs> it's a macro-atmospheric issue that has micro-manifestations. As to the macro issue, South Carolina has the largest reduction, percentage reduction of greenhouse gases of any state in the country. Now, I want, to, I want to, somebody to raise their hand if they've ever read that in any media outlet. No, we haven't. And how have we done that? Because we know where our emissions are coming from. The largest reduction we've had is from energy where we've taken three coal plants off the grid and replaced it with utility scale solar. But solar is generating at about a penny megawatt and coal is about 3.2 cents a megawatt. Like we've brought smart people to the table on this. We can do that with this. And we have to have these conversations where people don't feel like they're being force fed, like they're part of the conversation. We are leading the world with this issue. And now we need to take care of our own people. This is the 500, 800,000 pound grill in the room. People don't want to be, until recently, don't want to be told what they can do with their property. And then there's home rule and there's all kinds of things. So I, I, I love hearing the conversation, it excites me. What I can tell you, Ken, is we're now in about 2,000 miles walking up and down the state. People want this. We wouldn't be having a meeting if we weren't asked, what can we do about it? It's not a hypothetical. People are scared to death of what they see. And it's largely cultural. People know that, the, you know, we're like a state that admires hunting and fishing and hiking, and people see what's going on, and they're worried to death about it. I was going to say, I think, I think your idea is good. And um, I think it's good to bring, try to bring people together, to try to use the municipality association. I think you should bring in developers. I think you should bring in Tom and the National Heritage Corridor and talk about with visuals how good things are doing. Because I think, you know, Senator, you said it best. People, a lot of people can't understand when you're just talking about it conceptually, but when they can see it, they really start to understand a lot better. And so, but I do think it's, because of people's times, like it's so hard, you know. Like, you know, they have four events today, right? So, like, if you can put it into one impactful meeting and bring all the right people to the table and give them two days of, you know, what we feel they need to know, I think that becomes impactful. But I think when you try to start saying, "Well, let's take a group and go here," and let's take a group there, then people start to feel like I can't commit that much like I can't commit all these days to do these things but this is a really important topic and like I said I mean, people are talking about it everywhere they're talking about it in Greenville and they're talking about it at the coast and everybody's and everybody understands because I can't tell you how many things I've been at where they're like put the closed sign out and stop it. we are closed we don't want anybody I mean, we had a senator propose charging a move-in tax, right? You move into the state, we're going to got to pay your move-in tax, right? And, and, and got a pretty good bit of support. <laughs> I, bet. I bet. Not to anybody moving here, but yeah. No, they don't get the vote. They don't get the vote, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so I, but I think it is, a, it, it is a conversation that everybody's now having. I think you used to say, even 10 years ago, Talk about something being green, like you were saying, and everybody's like, oh, you're one of those people. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you because you're one of those people. But now I think green means something different. I think Tom and Michelle have done a really great job about not saying, you know, um, we're going to ram this down your throat, but like, let's have a conversation. And Tom says it really good, and I've taken this and, and said it many times, is that, you know, you don't have to trade off um, you know, a profitability for sustainability. Like you can have both, and there's a way to do that. And, and when you start talking to about like that, like you know, how do you give up nothing to get more? People want to listen. I think that's important too, Lieutenant Governors, to the way that a 
group like this can encourage. You know, you, you, you see people slowly take a step out and then they look to the left and right, right? Well, you, you know, you, you ought to go left and right right now, right? So yes. it, to be able to do that, you know, Talk it up. takes a lot of courage to look at the, particularly the, the voting public and say, I, I know this doesn't really fit with what your predetermined narrative is, what you've been told from every media source for 20 years, but, but listen, to it, listen to it in a different way. That takes a lot of nerve, but that's also bold. And people love bold. And what people want, you know, I think you've hit upon it. For the longest time, uh, I, I've said I'm going to come up and, and target a new hashtag, facts not feelings, because for 20 years we run on feelings. Like, this is how I feel, this is how I feel about what I've heard. People are craving facts. And when you can give them facts, they're really starting to listen to you, because let's face it, they're skeptical of us, they're skeptical of the media, they're skeptical of people who believe in the environment, they're skeptical of people that don't, but people are just craving facts. Like, give me some facts, let me make my own decision. And when you do that, I think you earn their respect. I think that's when you get them to start listening to you. Like, I'm gonna give you these facts, and you're smart enough to figure some of this out. But I think what having a meeting like, you, like you're talking about does too, is like, you, Tom said it great, you go into a lot of small towns, you got <laughs> the guy that's running this, this show, the mayor, is also the pastor and has also works at the post office part time. And, and he doesn't know, right? He did, he was trying to give back to the community he was probably born in. And he doesn't have a lot of resources. And he doesn't have a, no a lot of knowledge about these things. But he doesn't want to step out there and say that. So when you provide him data and you provide him maybe videos, or you provide him uh, a space for him to come to learn about all this, he can learn about it without having to raise his hand and say, I don't know what the heck y'all are talking about. You know, I don't even know, I, I don't know what you mean. And to that point, you need to start with the basics. Yep. Just not assuming people know because they, something. Yeah, they really don't. They don't. And, and, they, and they won't raise their hand and say they don't. They're just not going right. to. And that kind of gets into what Tom and I have discussed about you know, turning maybe some elements of this resiliency conference into podcast or you know, something along those lines. But, mm -hmm. um, well, we have... We have less than 30 minutes left. Um, I don't know if there's some movement or action or something that this group would like to take moving forward. Um, I think if you know Tom's open to it, we can use the platform of the Com Resiliency Conference to maybe move something along. Um, if you have ideas, share them. I like the idea of doing uh, more in-depth focus using the Municipality Association because, it, but I think, like you said, you have to bring the developers in. Mm -hmm. You gotta bring the realtors in because now everybody's at odds with each other. And I'll, I'm telling you, I, I sat with um, the Realtors Association and local government, y'all their enemy right now. Okay. You're their enemy and I don't think it needs to be that way. Um, but they have, they have legitimate points that I think it's, it's best when you're in a very controlled environment for, that, for you, them to hear your perspective and you to hear their perspective and what they're trying to do. You know, like we're not the enemy, but this is what's happening. And I think sometimes, can't do it at a county council meeting. Can't do it at city council. I mean, that stuff can get too crazy. Yeah. Needs to be in a very, you know, safe environment where people feel like they can throw out ideas right. and, and, and understand everybody's point, right? Because in the middle is really the solution, right? You got a point, they got a point. And, and the really good thing is right here in the middle. So I, think, I, I would say that I think that's a great idea, something that should probably move forward sooner than later, because like everybody has agreed, the problem's moving quickly. Right. What was happening on the coast going back 15 years or so, but when I first started you know, thinking I might need to get in here and, and do this kind of stuff, was you had the developers who were playing chess and the citizens were playing checkers. You know, they have professionals, or if they're a big track builder, they do this all over the country. They know the game. They call your, you know, they, they call our council members. And Mount Pleasant, let's face it, it's a pretty sophisticated place. We have 17 Starbucks and one Waffle House. That is a terrible imbalance. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, no South, no so Starbucks. For all of them. Yeah. And, and I won't even count how many yoga studios we have. But, but what they do, they come and they wine and dine the council members and, and they do all this stuff. And sometimes you see 
oh, this, this developer made a $20,000 gift to one of our local nonprofits, and all of a sudden, you know, they're, it's not greening their record, but it's certainly, you know, using a charity for something like that. In Dorchester County, years ago, I'm looking for, you might, you might know this, um, that what they caught them doing was, in, and this was probably in the early 2000s, there was a big tract of land on the Ashley River that a national developer was trying to turn into track built homes right on the Ashley River. And so they would have their thing up, it, it had gone through the planning commission, they would have it up for a council vote. When they showed up and there were 250 citizens with pitchforks and torches there, they would withdraw it. And they played a game of attrition and, and they started winning in Dorchester, Dorchester County. And I can't remember if there's a state law on this, but I know Dorchester County did it and then we did it. If you have something and it's on the agenda and you withdraw it, there's a one year waiting period. That way you're not fooling the citizens because the folks with kids and soccer and the minivans and all that stuff, they can't show up five times. The developer will pull it off five. You pull something off our agenda, once it's gone through the process and it's up for a vote, it's a one year wait automatic. So I, I know I keep going down to the tactical, but this is the stuff that's hitting me in the face every month. You yeah. know? And, and we get we get to so, on, on Mayor, we stuff. literally have you, you just described two situations that we've had yeah. in the past year. Yeah. And and it got wrapped up with our moratorium and so now it got wrapped up with the municipal association uh, point of view. I'm curious about this, is the vested rights portion of that? Is there an expiration on those vested rights? That's something that we end up arguing about in the for Problem. This is a problem we have. Is you know they they get their approval. They got their approval during the Reagan administration, and then they sat and waited for the sewer line to get out there. Now that's smart, but you know what you lose a lot of corporate knowledge over those years. They're playing three D chess, and we're playing connect four. Yeah. So it's exactly the point. One of the things that I think could come out of this group um, since. You have that ask. I really like the idea of the smaller towns who don't have the professional staff to keep up with this. That there's some sort of educational program that maybe comes through the cog that carries some money with it to where it, uh, they can go to their council members and they can say, preacher, grocery store manager, yep. plant manager, the three of y'all, I just need y'all to vote to let me go to the cog and get these five pieces of training. That'll unlock funds for our sewer line expansion. If it was idea. like that, then, then I think that would really help your small, your small town. You want you to give yeah. me the clock? Yeah. <laughs> well, I volunteered that. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of the. I think that's a challenge of the strategic versus the tactical question because you have larger communities that are invested in that strategic vision, and then how to translate it to the tactical. These smaller communities can't get out of tactical long enough to think strategically, and, and they don't have that. Yes. So how do you get right. them into that conversation? That's a good point. So, um, and, and there is that trust factor to a great extent with the cop. I mean, they're already working, especially the we small, like so. small we municipalities. Yeah. They depend on you. I mean, so right. I mean we, trust us. We, we staff, like from a zoning administration standpoint, staff three of the towns in his county. You know, because <laughs> they just need somebody a day or two. city administrators. Right, and do all that the city Not all the cops do that, but we do that. Right. I do think that's very helpful for the smaller communities that just don't have the wherewithal to be able to hire somebody full time, things like that. And, you know, it's limited for us. We only have so many people, so we only do so many towns, but there's at times needs where, like, well, we can't do that for you, but we can do this, you know. And, but that becomes the challenge for the smaller communities. They, right. they don't have the bandwidth to do more than just the tactical. Right. And how do you get to that point? How, how do they get a hazard mitigation plan? Like, exactly. like our, our consultant ESP out of Raleigh, and they got a North Charleston office, is helping us not just the hazard mitigation plan, but in our sit down with them, we learned that there are federal grants that if you would put artificial turf on your athletic fields and do underground water retention for that, for stormwater retention, there's federal grants for that stuff. We're fortunate that we can afford those consultants and stuff. Right. We got all those Starbucks, right? And you know, all that money. But how do the small towns do this? And maybe we can find a grant source, you know, help them. Now what they're doing is helping us inventory our critical green infrastructure, which we have made the switch, you know, from, from gray to green. And um, 
they, they are helping us with GIS and everything else. So it's not, you, we all know that local government, right, <laughs> with, with green space, it's what happens to come on the market. There's no prioritization based on how much it helps us with runoff, you know, with, with keeping things cool and all that. It's just, oh, you know, the Hamlin track came up for sale. Oh boy, you better hope you got money to help us buy it, that type thing. And this is a more strategic way, but if the small towns can't afford that, they won't have that resource. You know, it's interesting. If you <coughs> repeat what I was saying <laughs> earlier, we don't have an education problem in Greenville, Spartanburg, Charleston, Aiken, Rock Hill. We don't have a health care problem, right? We don't, the, the, the indices where South Carolina lags are not in our larger, more affluent. If we don't solve this problem in the communities that y'all are talking about, we're not going to solve the problem. And that water is coming downhill, by the way. Right, so if we don't if we don't have a, a holistic vision for this, and dealing with those communities, we're we're not going to solve the problem. I mean, I, I hear you. If we don't go there, it's not a partial solution; it's a no solution. If you have six mile Iva West Pelzer, you don't get those guys. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. In the right. Exactly. Well, we have 15 minutes left. Um, where where where, where do you, you want to leave it? And like we come back, and we communicate by email, get back together on Zoom. You want to just kind of drop it and get back to what we were doing before? Where are you going to go? First thing I want to do is see if there's a way we can have this every year. I think this is the start of something really good, and, and it'll and it'll go out from here. And I know y'all planned it and funded and ran it, and it's, and it's perfect. And that's asking a lot. But I think the ripple effect from this and then bringing in others in. You know, maybe we sponsor another community. You know, maybe you get the, the Mount Pleasants and Charlestons and Greenville's and all, you know, to pick up, you know, talk to all and all, you know, talk to talk to Holly Hill and all and say, hey, why don't y'all come? Yeah, there's, there's, some merit, there's some merit to that. We this is a very small town version of that, but there's just if it's scalable, like y'all are talking about this. We started having a, 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 a administrator's breakfast. Seen an anchor movie Anchorman? You know when he says, "No, it's the it's the pancake breakfast." We do it every month. Well, we we do that with the city administrators come to my office and we have breakfast for them. Uh, but what came out of that is we have two towns that don't have any infrastructure. Uh -huh. The town of Six Mile and the the town of Norris, which I, a lot of people don't know where that is. But you actually you've been there. I was, <laughs> you know where it is. Right? <laughs> it's here, it's here. But the town of Norris, you know, and the the, the Anne's the clerk, of course, the head of the water department. She's everything. The clerk of council. Yeah, exactly. The grant writer. Uh, it, wouldn't it be neat if we could adopt a few of those little towns? Mm -hmm. And the larger towns through, through, you know, shepherded through here so it's not something the towns are taking on. You could give them some professional expertise. Now, I know that the municipal association is going to say, and they're going to be right, we're here, we're here for you. But, but you know, they may need... The, the profits, they may need the encouragement that that and y'all have the technical knowledge and that could be part of it. Uh, but I wonder if we couldn't adopt through some type of loose association of uh, administrators slash mayors uh, some of the places that need some professional assistance and help educate them on this issue. Seems like y'all have a good idea. Who might be some good candidates for that? Too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then we, we got three employees that are in the field. Four days a week. Yeah. Um, just worked on our annual statistics. 3,900 contacts last year with municipal officials. To, uh, technical assistance. Well, I know the towns in our our jurisdiction they could not speak higher. Yeah, but it may be, that's just that's just a tip. Yeah, yeah, it is really. There is a need for much more on lake district. Yeah. 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 Talking about planning efforts in small towns. Yeah. 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 Most of the cards have to charge a fee to get an offense plan and zoning licenses to find their budgets. COGS versus private consultants, we're looking at twenty to forty thousand dollars for a comprehensive plan zoning ordinance. Uh, and even when they get those documents, they no longer administer. And the turnover rate in these small towns is but, mm -hmm. Is it like staff or elected or both? Uh, both. both. Oh. 
the, uh, the staff in the particularly small towns, court positions are turning over every six months to take a As soon as you get somebody trained, uh, administrators turn over fast. Uh, we have a few small communities that are beginning to hire planners that haven't traditionally had staff planners, but that turns over really fast too. And you know, they've, they've gone from having nothing to having somebody that built something and then they, like, see, Ben Midler just had a pair of leave in Lancaster County. And so all of a sudden it's like, how do we find, it's hard to find planners, it's hard within the right range and things like that. It's a challenge for all of them to be consistent in that effort. Yeah, it's still an old school way of thinking. I, when, when I took the, the idea that we were going to adopt the town of Norris, that the city administrator and the county administrator were going to come together and help the town of Norris uh, with any issues there might, might be having, you know, they were, some, they were skeptical. They were saying, that, you know, how much is it going to cost us? Yeah. Want to try to, to take us, us over? Try to take us over. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. Trying to run everything. But it was to, to your point about the, the, the professional staff and the, and the sophistication there. Uh, I got there because the meeting was supposed to start at seven, and the meeting didn't start. And they had a quorum, and the mayor was there, and the, and the clerk was there, and I was just sitting. I was the only person in the audience. And they finally said one of the city council members. They said, "Well, he he's." He's still cutting grass. He'll be here in a little bit. And he was literally cutting grass until it got dark. And then he just came in and they started the council meeting. So you, when you try to bring this expertise into these the, these towns, you know, you, you got to be mindful of that. But I really think there's an option out there, an opportunity. Before I say this, I'd like to say that this is just my good idea, Ferry, for a moment. I think we go to the universities and ask them to dedicate 10 graduate students, those that have graduate programs, to be a part of this. If we're going to allocate, you know, the Citadel's got the new climate, mm -hmm. we've got MPAs, like let's go to them and let's create a, a uh, list of intellectual talent we can take out our universities and apply to these local places. Use what we got. Yeah. Um, right quick before, I know you got to go, you got to yeah. get to something else. I wanted to, um... We have our first Legislator of the Year award. We're going to call it Alexander, uh, and we uh, don't go anywhere. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the South Carolina 7. Uh, President of the Senate has been with us, like a lieutenant governor, from the very start. Uh, he always starts SC7, and we'd like to extend uh, recognition as the legislative champion for 2024 to the President of South Carolina. They all stand up. Give oh, us a big round of Coordinated in my pastoral duties since we have the real Reverend yeah. cousin of Thomas Alexander, Terry. <laughs> Terry, would you end us in prayer? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm late. I have to go to Columbia and take care of some state business. It was in good hands. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for this moment and for this hour. Thank you for what you've done here. More importantly, what has to be said to remind us that he that is great, that of preserve, not out of arrogance, but out of sense to do that. Now, you've given us this land, you've given us this country, you've given us this earth. Now, help us to be better stewards. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 So, we're going to have a little bit of Thanks for coming. Thanks.